Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. For several weeks now, we've been taking some time to really kind of uh, process and discuss various aspects of the Ten Commandments, things that are quite important to cover on the front end of this topic, uh, even getting into uh, arguments made by professing Christians that would have us believe that the Ten Commandments are no longer valid for Christians today, for believers, that they no longer have authority, they're no longer, we're no longer to receive instruction, even conviction uh, from these. Well, today we're going to get back to work, and today we're going to dig back into the commandments themselves, and if you haven't been with us for a while, uh, just to bring you up to speed Thus far, we've actually covered the first two commandments within the Ten Commandments. The first commandment being this, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. Pretty straightforward. And, and basically, just to reiterate, this is the Lord showing that he doesn't deal with competition well. He doesn't appreciate it. He doesn't want part of your heart. He doesn't want almost all of it. He wants everything. Your total faith, your hope, your trust, 100% needs to be in him. And then we move to the second commandment. You should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So one more thing that I need to cover in regard to this commandment. And it's really something in, in a sense of clarification. And how do we understand this? You know, many years ago, I had a gentleman ask me, and I've actually gotten this question in so many various ways over the years. You know, we have this thing, of what I like to call a revival, where Christians are waking up to the Torah. And it's a whole new experience, and they're, they're rushing in, and they're seeing that now they get to see the whole Bible. And in the process, all sorts of questions arise. One of those questions, inevitably, is trying to define what a graven image is, a carved image. You can go into our houses. Uh, some people have teddy bears, or maybe the, the girls, the, the young girls play with dolls. Uh, in this situation of this gentleman uh, that I was talking to many years ago, he had, uh, I, I think it was a moose that was literally whittled out of wood. And it was a decorative item on his end table. And he asked me, he goes, Daniel, after reading this, he goes, Daniel, you know, is this a graven image? Because this is a thing on the earth. It's an image of something on the earth. Is this a graven image? Do I got to burn this? You know, Deuteronomy 7. And my response is, well, it depends. And he said, depends on what? Well, my response is, do you burn incense to it? Do you sacrifice to it? Have you bent the knee to it? Have you called upon it for help? Have you called upon it for healing? Have you called upon it to prosper to provide for you. I mean, this is about worship. And of course, he's like, of, of course not. And so this is something that we have to discuss before we get to the third commandment, what this commandment is really saying and what it is not saying. Now, the key thing is, is that, you know, whether it's a moose on your end table or whatever, there is no problem with that in and of itself. But the moment you turn to put your heart towards it, to trust into it, to depend on it, you have a serious problem. And that is exactly what this is conveying. And I'm going to prove this uh, today, and we're going to go through this so that you understand this is not Daniel's opinion. Okay? This is, this is the word of God. And so as you continue, the very next thing that is said, so here it says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Then it says this. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. This is not a new statement. We're not to compartmentalize this. This is not a new idea. This phrase goes right along with, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. They're to be brought collectively together and understood. Now, to help you appreciate the reality of what I'm saying, I'm going to take you to the Torah, to the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 21. And there, we are going to find that, unfortunately, Israel has fallen again. They're starting to complain against God. They're complaining against Moses. And the Lord has had enough. And so what's he do? He plagues the people with serpents. He sends serpents out, and they literally start killing people. 
I mean, we're told in scripture, we're not told, we're not given a number, but it says many in Israel died. The Lord is furious. And so Israel responds, and this is what we read in Numbers 21, verse 7. Therefore, the people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent. This is a, a bronze serpent. And set it on a pole And it shall be that everyone who's bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Let me ask you a question. Did something change between Exodus 20 and Numbers chapter 21? Did God change his mind in regard to graven images, which is, this is exactly what the serpent on a pole was. It's a graven image. Now, obviously, I'm asking this rhetorically because the answer is God did not change his mind. The commandment holds, nor is God asking Israel to do something that is contrary to the commandment that he gave to them, that every man, woman, and child heard from the Mount Sinai. He hasn't changed. This is not contradiction. It's about understanding. You'll notice the absence of, there was to be no worship. What's he command them to do? You're just simply to look at it. They were commanded to look at this thing. And so here's a perfect example scripturally of showing it's not about making a graven image in and of itself, which this is very symbolic, and there's an incredible story behind all of this. We're not going to get into that. I want to stay on task today. But the point I want to make today, we're not going to start a new series, I promise, within the Ten Commandments. I'm not doing it. I'm not. I held strong, you guys. Okay. But... We need to make a distinction. This is not a breach of the second commandment. Now, here's where things get interesting. If you fast forward, you move forward about 700 years in time, the serpent, this bronze serpent, reemerges. I mean, it's virtually silent. We hear nothing about it until we get into the days of Hezekiah. And then as you get to 2 Kings 18, we read this. Check this out. He, Hezekiah, removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and what did he do? And broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moshe had made. Why? Why does Hezekiah do this? Check this out. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. So do, do you understand? So it went from, it's fine, you can make this image. It was, God never commanded them to worship it. They were just simply supposed to look at it. No problem with the carved image until they begin to burn incense. They sacrifice to it. They rely upon it. They are praying to it. They call upon it as a God. Now you have a problem, and now it needs to be destroyed. And so what a perfect example so that we can appreciate and understand what this second commandment is really ushering in and what it is asking It's not asking you to get rid of, you know, the carved moose that's sitting on your end table, of course, unless you trust in it, unless you believe in it. At that time, you would absolutely burn it. Let me take this a step further. Solomon goes to build the temple. The entire temple is inundated with carved images. It's everywhere. Check this out. So here's an artist's rendition of this. Look at the brazen brazen laver. This is... um, You have all these oxen, 12 oxen that held up what is called the sea. And this is where the priests, when they went in, they would wash their hands and feet in this water. And the 12 oxen are symbolic. Now listen to me. These graven images of bronze oxen, they have meaning. They're powerful symbols of the tribes of Israel. You'll notice that they're pointed outward, north, south, east, and west, Because prophetically speaking, Israel would go out into the world, that great commission, that Yeshua commissioned the apostles, they would be light to the nations, and they would bring the message of repentance and salvation. And so, very, very powerful imagery. But isn't it fascinating? Go back to Exodus 32. You go back to Exodus 32, Israel makes one golden calf, and the Lord loses it. But yet Solomon goes to build the temple, he builds 12 of them. No problem. What's the difference? We'll go back to Exodus 32. 
They built the golden calf for the express purpose to worship it. They actually call it Yahweh. They worship and sacrifice to it. That's the problem. You get the distinction? Look at the walls on the inner side. And what we're told scripturally is all these walls, things, you're not supposed to make, you know, carved images of things in heaven, things on earth. And here you have things of heaven and things of earth. You have carabine carved into the walls of the sanctuary. You have palm trees. You had flowers. These were carvings that were carved into the entire walls. We could take it a step further, and then you go into the Holy of Holies, and you have carabim in there. Images of things that are in heaven. Go even further than that. All of these, what I call these little mini lavers that Solomon built, they had etched in them lions, oxen, and carabim carved into them. Everywhere you go, you can even talk about Solomon's uh, his house of judgment. When he built this house of judgment, and we're told he sat on a great white throne. Solomon sits on this great white throne. There's six steps going up to the throne, and on each step are two carved images of lions. And then he himself, on his throne, you had these two huge carved images of lions. Are any of these things going against the direct command of God and making images? And the answer is absolutely not. I assure you, if Jewish people went in to the temple and started worshiping these oxen, their fate would have been that of what happened with the brazen or the bronze serpent. It's the exact same thing. They would have tore them out. That's when it becomes, that's when you desecrate the name of the Lord. That's when you pervert an image. Images are powerful. They mean something. You look at this, it has meaning. How many of you have menorahs in your house? That's an image. You have a menorah. Why? I have a menorah. I have a Hanukkah. They mean something to us. But the moment you bow down to that thing and you start calling it Nehushtan or whatever you want to call that, that thing needs to be destroyed. That thing needs to be taken out of your house. Do you understand? Does that make sense? All right. I want to land here. I want to take you to the Psalms and really just show you a passage that just encompasses this whole discussion on idolatry of, you know, really the first and second commandment. And I just want to bring this full circle with this passage. In Psalm 121, a song of ascents, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Here you have the psalmist. It's important you understand what he is doing. He's lifting his eyes to the hills. What are on the hills? It's all the high places. This is where you would go. The nations would go up to worship and and burn incense and sacrifice to all the pagan deities. So he's looking at the hills. And I can tell you, I've I've been in Israel. And the very first place I went to was a high place at the top of a hill. It was a pagan altar where they sacrificed to pagan deities. And so the psalmist is looking at all of these options, if you will, of pagan deities, and the nations and the peoples would go up. Why would you go up to a pagan deity? You want help. You want victory. You want to prosper. You may want to be healed. You need help from the Lord. And the the psalmist asks, where does my help come from? And we know the rest. His help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And that just, you know, this is such a cool passage that really encompasses the reality of why you would want to embrace the first and second commandment. The impact, our help, other gods, putting any other gods in front of our God. Going to serve carved images makes no sense because there's no help. But there is help in Yeshua. There is hope in Yeshua. There is healing in Yeshua. There is forgiveness in him. And so we go to him. Very, very powerful. Now that said, let's break some new ground today, and we're going to jump into the third commandment, and this is what we read. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Two things said in this commandment. Obviously, the first is the commandment itself. Don't take his name in vain. But the second thing I want to deal with first, and I'll highlight this, the Lord is not going to hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does that really mean? How are we supposed to understand that? 
Well, to help you appreciate really what's being conveyed, I want to take you to the Targums and how the Targums translate this passage. This is what the Targums say. My people, children of Israel, let no one of you take the name of the Lord his God in vain because on the day of the great judgment, the Lord will not acquit the one who shall take the name of the Lord his God in vain. You want to talk about putting things into perspective? You know, when it starts talking about the Lord's not going to hold him guiltless, we are talking about eternal judgment. We are talking about life and death. We're talking about heaven and hell. This is what's on the table. It puts this commandment in a completely different context. It makes you take it quite seriously. But when you think about the fact that this has been added, that's where things get very unique. You know, we can go through script. You can, we're going to go through the rest of the Ten Commandments someday. We'll get there. And one thing you'll notice that is lacking is that, okay, so we're told, thou shall not kill. But it doesn't go on to say, the Lord will not hold him guiltless. Who kills? We can say, don't commit adultery. It doesn't say the Lord will not hold him guiltless who commits adultery. And we could go on. You're not going to find this statement anywhere. It's the only time it is made. And to, to make things even more bizarre, let me add this. We, disco- we discovered in the second commandment, what did we see? We saw this warning. The Lord sends this warning. He says, I will visit the iniquity of, of the fathers to the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but show mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And so God gives this warning. We have a warning attached to the second commandment, which encompasses all the commandments. But then as you get to the third, we are given a death threat. That's what it is. This is a death threat. Why is this added to this commandment? And I'm going to tell you why. And you're going to appreciate this as we get further into this. There is something here that the Lord wants you to pay special attention to. There is a level of deception here with this particular one. That is frightening. And you're going to see that. And so with that said, let's dig, dig into the commandment itself. And let me highlight this. We'll flip-flop. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know, when I was a young man, and I grew up in a, I think most of you know, I grew up in a conservative Christian home. And, you know, I got to hear the Bible. And my dad was really diligent about reading me, uh, reading stories and going through Bible studies uh, every day. And so I, I really grew up, and, and I got to tell you, even in my 20s, my perspective and my understanding of what this commandment meant uh, is somewhat different than what I know today. See, back then, I understood this commandment to refer to people using the name of Jesus or Jesus Christ or the name God in a derogatory way, in the context of per- profanity of cursing, of using the glorious and holy and precious name and literally dragging it through the garbage and dirt. And that was my understanding of this. And so when I hear the people take you know, what we would say, they're taking the, the Lord's name in vain, this is always what came to my mind. Now let me be clear on something. People that use the sacred name of Jesus or Jesus Christ or God or Lord in an unholy manner like that as profanity, they are in breach of this commandment. What this commandment is conveying, it, it fits the context. And so that is legitimately taking the Lord's name in vain as we traditionally understand it. But my understanding today is much broader. What God is really conveying is terrifying. And that's what we need to get to. We need to understand what is really being conveyed. And to do that, let's begin, and we're going to put up the Hebrew here. Lo tisa et shem Yahweh Elohecha Lashav. There's one word that we need to focus on. This one word unlocks all sorts of doors of understanding to this passage. And what is that word? That is this word vain in the English or in the Hebrew, it is shav. Pay very close attention. Listen to that word. You're going to be seeing quite a bit of it today. Shav. And it's what we translate as vain. Let me put up a, just a brief definition of what this word really means. 
Here we have false, or it's falsity or falsehood, a lie, deceit, vain vanity, worthlessness. We have all these different words in the English language that we can use to draw out this meaning. I could add uselessness, and I can add other words as well. But all of these words really encompass what shav means. Now, to further help you appreciate this word, I'm going to show you it in action in the sense of I want to show you how scriptures utilize this so you can see the context. I want to begin in Psalm 26, verse 4. This is what we read. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, idolatrous men. Guess what? In the Hebrew, that word is shav. I have not sat with false men. This is what's being conveyed. False men, deceitful men. Psalm 12, verse 2, we read this. They speak idly, and when it say they, it's dealing, we're, we're talking about the wicked. The wicked speak idly, and that word is shav. They speak falsely. Everyone to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Deuteronomy 5, 20, going to the Torah. You shall not bear false shav, false witness against your neighbor. And take this in. For us to really understand what God is communicating, take this in. What God is saying is is that don't go out and say, your neighbor did ABC when your neighbor never did that. That's shav. You're professing one thing, but the truth is another. Exodus 23, verse 1, last one I'll show you. You shall not circulate a shav. A shav report, a false report. And so here you can see scriptural context looking at really understanding the word shav in the context of falsity. And let me me build on this. Earlier in the series, Josephus, we looked at Josephus was a first century Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was a historian. Uh, His works are well known today. He actually gives his own version of the Ten Commandments and looking at how he articulates it, you learn a lot. Well, in this third commandment, he brings it out and this is how he records the third commandment. The third, that we must not swear by God in a false matter. He understands Josephus being really a Pharisee, therefore an expert in the law. He understands exactly what Shav means. It refers to false. The Targums. Thou shalt not swear in the name of the Lord thy God vainly, for the Lord will not acquit him who sweareth in his name with falsity. And so over and over again, what I'm telling you is as we look at this word Shav, this word as coming to us in the English It is a direct reference to falsehood. In other words, what is really being conveyed? I'm going to tell you. I'll make it very simple. What is being conveyed is don't you dare go out and wrap your lie in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. Don't wrap it in the the lie that thus says the Lord when thus the Lord has not spoken. Don't attempt to impose your will upon other people, or what you feel so strongly in your heart, it's so overwhelming, you get this grand emotion that wells up in you, and you know what you do? You just blurt out and say, so that you can have credibility to your thoughts and your opinions by using the sacred name of the living God. That just opened a whole new door to understanding what it means to take the holy name of the Lord and shav, la shav. That doesn't work. I want to take you to the book of Ezekiel because I want to show you this actually in action. This is really powerful. And as we go through this, you're going to feel the weight of this. At least I hope you do. Ezekiel 13, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy. Now think about this. What is a prophet's job? Prophet has a job of prophesying. And with all due respect, it is not out of line for the sheep of Israel, for the inhabitants, for the people, for the congregation to expect the prophets to do what they were called to do. 
And what are they called to do? The prophet is called, they're the shepherds. They are called to deliver the truth to Israel. They're called to convey the heart of the Lord. They're called to convey comfort when God wants that expressed. They're called to convey conviction when God wants that expressed. They're called to deliver the word. This is a prophet's job. Convey the word of the Lord. And so for the inhabitants to expect that, it's not out of line at all. They should be expecting it. But here you can clearly see we have a serious problem because now God is commissioning Ezekiel as a prophet. He's commissioning Ezekiel to go speak against the prophets of Israel. And they're prophesying. What is the problem? Check this out. And they say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of the Lord. Do you understand the problem? The problem is, is that what these prophets are bringing to the sheep does not come from the well of the Lord, of his word and his truth that he conveyed to them. It comes from their own heart, their own emotion, their own feeling. And I got to tell you, we are all emotional creatures. This is where things get so scary. And we seem to have very strong opinions about what we think. Very strong opinions. In fact, when we feel something, it's intense. And these prophets are been moved with this intensity of this emotion. And now they are speaking and they are using the good name of the Lord to cover and wrap words that only come from themselves. Ideas that come from their own hearts. This is not a good situation. So verse 3, we pick it up. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. These prophets have seen nothing, they've heard nothing, and yet they're speaking. They're using the holy name of God. And by doing that, guess what they do? They get to sanctify their own agenda. They get to impose their will upon people using the authority of the name. Now, if God truly speaks to you and you use his name to speak to others, you can rest on that authority of that name. But when you wrap that authority in your lie and what comes from you, I don't care how emotional you are, how overwhelmed you are with that feeling in your heart, I kid you not, you have overstepped the line. And that's where it gets scary. We go to verse 6. They have envisioned futility. Let's stop. What is that word in the Hebrew? Shav. They've envisioned a falsehood. They've envisioned a lie. And false divination saying, oh, thus says the Lord, but the Lord has not sent them. Now get this, and this is huge. Yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. That word in the Hebrew for, where is it? Hope at the end. It's yachal. You know what that means? It means to wait. I I, I want you just to take take that in for a second. They've out prophesying. They are moved by emotion. They feel something so passionately, they have to convey the message. And when they convey the message, they themselves are so convinced that this is of the Lord that they are stepping back and waiting for it to unfold. Do you know how scary this is? Now, just think about this whole process, and especially think about how the enemy has worked and how we've seen him work in regard to prophets. Listen to me carefully, because what I'm about to tell you, don't ever forget it. This is so huge, because the perspective that many Christians have of false prophets is completely distorted. For some odd reason, when... We typically think of a, of a false prophet. What we think about is a man that's always been identified as a false prophet, as though they came to church with a, with a name tag on their, and the thing that says, you know, who are you? Well, I'm a false prophet. That is not, if you want any appreciation for the level of deception and examples that we have in Scripture of false prophets, understand this, they are true prophets, They are true, accurate prophets where God has spoken to them. He spoke his word, and guess what? They delivered to to Israel. 
And God spoke to them again, and they delivered it again. And guess what happened? It came to pass. And then God speaks to them again, and then they deliver it. But then something happens. The enemy can creep in and convince these men that what they feel in their heart and their emotions is so real. Go ahead and speak the word because it will be just as it was the last couple times that you prophesied. So the prophet gets used to this being in awe at whatever he says, it comes to pass. You got to think about what this prophet and how the enemy can come in and twist things up. He speaks something and it comes to pass. He spoke something and it comes to pass. And the enemy can come in through great deceit and convince the person, just speak again. And guess what? The same thing's going to happen as has always happened. I mean, where a true prophet derails, is, is, it's terrifying. In that moment, he is a prophet of God until he actually stops conveying the word of the Lord and starts conveying his own heart. You want a perfect example of this? And I, we're not going to get into this today. I've, I've talked about it in the past. But Jeremiah 28, two prophets come to town. They're in the temple going toe to toe. You have Jeremiah the prophet, you have Hananiah the prophet. And Hananiah's prophesying peace upon Jerusalem. He's prophesying that Jerusalem, God, the God of Israel, is going to restore Yerushalayim. Now that sounds like a great prophet. That sounds like a God thing to me. Sounds amazing. The only problem is he was lying. He was speaking of his own court, but he felt it. He felt every bit of it. And this was a prophet of God, not a false prophet. He was a prophet of God. And it's something he desired so badly and wanted so badly. So he goes out and he speaks the word that Jerusalem's going to be responding. You know, I want to take this a step further to show you how frightening this is. Jeremiah, a true prophet that never stopped being a true prophet, hears the words of this prophet and he says, Amen. May it be so. But it's interesting, Jeremiah will end up going on and say, but understand this, Jeremiah adds a warning. The prophet who comes out and prophesies peace, we will know he is a true prophet when peace comes. But if it doesn't, then we know he's a liar. So take heed. Now that's, that is an amazing thought. So as we look at the deception that swirls about with what we see happening with the prophets, of they're, they're prophesying. And how just in a, a moment, they can derail giving over like Hananiah in Jeremiah 28 to this overwhelming desire of their own heart. We so badly want it to be this way. You know, we got a, we got a boatload of an eyeful of this type of activity when all these people came in out and said Donald Trump is actually going to be president. Even though they swore in Biden. They felt it so passionately, they spoke in the name of the Lord and said, I have a message of the Lord. There was video after video. They're harder to find now because they're taking them down, interestingly enough. But prophet after prophet coming on the scene, feeling something so deeply, and they wanted nothing more for this to happen. And it never happened. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me carefully. You do not want to fall into this trap. You, this is where you remember the death threat. The moment you step out, the moment you get bold, the moment you give into all these emotions, you want to pose your will and your ideas and your opinions on other people and say, thus says the Lord, that this is what the Lord has said. Oh, watch out because he's coming. Verse 7. Have you not seen a futile, here we go again, shav? You've seen a false vision. And, you have, not, and have you not spoken false divination? You say, all oh, the Lord says, but I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense. And I love this translation of what? Shav. You've spoken falsely. You've lied. You've envisioned lies. Therefore, here we go, I am indeed against you, says the Lord. You want to make yourself an enemy of the Lord? Start prancing around and telling people, you know, God told me this. 
when God hasn't told you anything, but you're speaking out of the well of your own heart. And yeah, your emotions are real. Those things that you are feeling, your feelings are real. It takes a real believer to be able to crucify the flesh, to crucify those emotions, and to be self, to display self-control and say, you know what, I'm not going to say God said. It'd be another thing for you to come out and say, you know what, I feel. I feel this. This is what I feel. But you don't cross that line. I, I wonder if there's a person in this room, even one, that has not taken the Lord's name in vain. At some point, And your life. Only God knows this. Daniel doesn't know this. But if you were to ask me of what I estimate, every single person in this room has taken his name in vain. Every single person in this room at some point has got caught up in their own emotions and overwhelmed, and they crossed that line. And I'm going to tell you, we're going through these Ten Commandments because we got to get the dross. It's got to come up. And there has to be true repentance where the word is working the repentance, where the word is convicting you, where the word is coming out. This gives us a chance. We have hope in Yeshua. We can have forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's what this is about. This is about self-introspection and going, have I done this? If there's been a time, and you know what, if you don't, I'm going to advise you You get on your knees and say, Lord, if I have done this, if I have abused your holy name for the sake of my own opinion, forgive me. Because I don't want to be an enemy of the living God. And it's something that you see Christianity as a whole is so bold in being able to do. The Lord said this to me, and the Lord said that to me. Uh, Okay, if you're going to say that, just please understand what's at stake. If you, if you want to take that, and you want to be that bold, and if you're a true prophet, if God has truly given you a message and a word of the Lord, then you should boldly speak it, as all the prophets have. Verse 9. My hand will be against the prophets who envision, what? Shav. Falsity. His hand, you will experience the hand of the living God against you, who divine lies... They shall not be in the assembly of my people, oh, nor written in the record of the house of Israel. Now, there's a deep spiritual connotation to this statement right here. This is is a direct reference to the book of life, to those who are inscribed in the book of life. And here's the thing. You want to cross the line, you want to take the Lord's name in vain, you will never be written in the record of the house of Israel. You'll never be written in the Lamb's book of life. That put some weight into this commandment. And then it goes on and says, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Again, deep spiritual connotation. It's not talking about simply, you're never fleshly going to come into the land of Israel as we understand it today. It's way beyond that. That's not the ultimate thing that it's talking about. It's talking about inheriting the kingdom of God. I mean, we know from the book of Hebrews that Abraham dwelt as a foreigner, as a stranger in the land of promise. And then we're told that he, because he waited for this city, meaning the new Jerusalem, line, whose builder and maker is God, and then he died not having the promises. I mean, this is, a, this is a powerful statement. You'll never get into the kingdom of God. Waiting. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. And so here's the takeaway. You have to reframe from letting your emotions getting the better of you, from letting your own agenda, your own opinions be the end of you. You have to show, you have to be diligent to the Lord. You have to show a spiritual strength that says, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to say it unless you said it. Oh, this gets way scarier when you think about this book. You know, to a degree, every single one of you operate at times as a prophet, as a priest. You know, the prophet's job was to bring the word of the Lord. The priest's job was to bring the word of the Lord, to teach the people. What happens when you start teaching out of this book and you start teaching things that are total corruption than what God originally intended? What do you think 
is going to happen? What do you think you're going to be accused of? You are going to experience that death threat firsthand. You don't get to go out and say, oh, thus says the Lord, and here, let me interpret you know, this specific passage to you, and you totally corrupted the passage. You're not going to walk away from that. You are taking the, Lord, the, the Lord's name in vain. That's what's happening. And I give you example after example of how many people I have seen fall into this. I can remember this pastor, Christian pastor, gay, who is talking about his husband and how his marriage was a gift of God. And a proof of that is just the Bible because God is love and the biblical concept is, the Bible, all it talks about is love. And so the Bible supported what he was doing. Do you understand that that context, that is a perfect example. Someone is taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. They are taking the passions and the emotions and the desires of their own heart and they're wrapping them in the holy name of Jesus. The death threat, God will make good on it. We, we, we cannot do this. And that should make us tremble. You know, there's a reason that James says, let not many of you become teachers. There's too much at stake. And how, and I've told you this before, how I want to step down. I don't want the mantle. I don't want to be responsible. I mean, how many of this being, I'm telling you, honestly, I don't want the responsibility. I do not. I'd rather, because I know that's much heavier. If I'm going to be judged stricter than you, God help me. But this is the weight we have to feel. This is the weight you have to feel. You want to go bring whatever you know in the word to people? Keep it in the back of your mind that I've got to keep my emotions in check. I've got to keep what I believe in check. And I can only extract what God intended. Our job, when we go out and we, we preach the gospel or we, we teach the word, just give the people exactly what the Lord intended and not our own version of it. It's a lot of repentance that needs to happen, I'm sure of it. 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 9, check this out. Ahab, the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat each on his throne, and they sat at the threshing floor of the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. So you have the king of Judah, you have the king of Israel, they've come together, you know, Jehoshaphat, kind of a backstory, Jehoshaphat aligned himself with Ahab by marrying his daughter. And so Jehoshaphat and Ahab have come together and the prophets are prophesying, they're doing their thing. And verse 10, now Zedekiah the son of Hanaanah had made horns of iron for himself. And he said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. So here this prophet Zedekiah comes before them prophesying victory, prophesying total hope and conquering the Syrians. Be encouraged. He's offering encouragement. And then it gets crazier. And all the prophets prophesied so saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. So now you're talking about, now we got prophets all over the place. We have a testimony of two and three. More than two and three. And they're all saying the same thing. The Lord is with you. Go in the strength of the Lord. This is, this is about thus says the Lord. Who, shouldn't, who wouldn't want to go in the word of the Lord? Who shouldn't want to go in the strength of the Lord? It's it interesting. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord. Isn't the body and the face supposed to be one accord? With one accord, encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like one of them and speak encouragement. Right now, Micaiah is feeling the weight of two kingdoms on him. The kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. He's feeling the weight of the messenger. The pressure is coming down on Micaiah. Just conform. Just say what all the other prophets are saying. Go and encourage the king. And guess what? You know, if you encourage the king, what's going to happen? I'm going to encourage all the children of Israel. Wasn't that going to be fantastic? I love his response. He said, 
as the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that I will speak. Micaiah came on the scene to hold the line. He didn't bend, he didn't break. And actually, and we're not, I didn't put this up here, but the way he gets repaid, and, and there's much more to the story, but he goes out and tells him exactly what the Lord told him, that the Lord's put a lying spirit in all the mouth of these prophets, and you're going to be led to your destruction. So how does Micaiah get repaid for actually bringing the word of the Lord? He's fed with the bread of affliction and thrown in jail. They take him away. That's his payment for doing this. But what a template when I look at this guy to hold the line like this. I mean, this is a guy who has Jeremiah's heart. Jeremiah's heart who held the line. No matter how badly he wanted something and he wanted Jerusalem restored, he's not going to cross the line and say something the Lord never said. I mean, we need the church, Corner Fringe, and the church at large needs a whole boatload of Micaiah's and Jeremiah's. They don't get caught up in emotion, but they they fear the living God. Going back to Ezekiel now, chapter 13, verse 22. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and you have strengthened the hands of the wicked so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life. This is what happens to prophets of God who derail and become false prophets. They become They cater to itching ears. They want to please the people. They want to tell the people what they want to hear. And they don't tell them what they need to hear. And so what do they do? They jump ship and they start strengthening the hands. As people are caught up in sin, they encourage, it's okay, you'll be fine. As Jeremiah describes this perfectly, for thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me. Do you know what that means? It means those who will not keep his commandments. They're now refusing to observe his commandments. This is important, especially in the coming weeks. They say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, oh, you shall have shalom. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil should come upon you. You'll be okay. Don't worry. God loves you. You're going to be fine. You, you, you know, you, you have a problem with pornography. You know what? A lot of people have a problem with pornography. Don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up over this. It's okay. You want to enter into an alternative lifestyle? God loves you just the way you are. In that expression, you understand how this works? And even, it can even happen with their own children where the parents do not run the hard line, they do not say the hard things because they don't want to offend their children. I don't want to push my children farther away. Or you don't maybe even say something to your parents respectfully because you don't want to ruin this. I mean, what kind of prophets are we? I mean, who are we? This is what this today is about. Yeshua says this, he says, beware of false prophets. In other words, beware of men who take his name in vain. These are men who take his name in vain, who come to us in sheep's clothing. They want to look like us. They pretend like they're one of us, that yes, they go to church with us. They go to Bible study. They may even come to prayer. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. Because they do exactly what we said. You know what? They'll strengthen the hands of the wicked. And yet, they'll condemn and they'll make sad the hands of the righteous. Live in a tipsy-topsy world. Second Peter 2.1, we're going to end in this. But there are also false prophets among the people, even as, listen, to there will be false teachers among you. Because that, understand, again, if I'm going to be a false teacher taking something in the word, and I take it out of context, and I twist it, I am taking the holy name of the Lord in vain. And Peter says they will be among us who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying Yeshua who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many, not some, many will follow their destructive ways because whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Do you understand? When men and women 
feel compelled to, to go up and speak out of their own emotions and out of the dictates of their own heart, pushing forward and wrapping it in the name of Jesus or in the name of Yeshua to give credentials, to give authority to those words, and yet God has not spoken, there are catastrophic implications on that. And it's not just on the person who is deceived as Paul, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, he says, men, imposters, would go out deceiving and being deceived. Exactly what we read in the book of Ezekiel. These men are deceived themselves, but the implications of those words, it doesn't just stay with the deceived person, it begins to affect others. And so as we dig into this, and we're not done, we have more to cover uh, in regard to taking the Lord's name in vain, so we'll save the rest of that for next week. Uh, Let's go into a time of prayer.